My name is Hal Brownstein, a.k.a. Hal Brown. I'm just a regular guy, an American, but I'm a Jew first. Born in 1947 in Newark, New Jersey at Beth Israel Hospital. And I am a artist, jewelry designer. Uh, I've been doing that for about 45 years on and off. Now I've been doing it full time for the last 20 years. And it's my passion. Hopefully I have another 20 years of doing it and that will bring me up to be about 89 years old. My first recollections besides just the family unit around me out in the world was, uh, I guess, the local barbershop. Many young kids don't get to go to the barbershop so early, but I happened to be born with a full head of hair. Pompadour, I mean, they parted my hair and gave me a pompadour at birth. But I remember being about four years old, and I was in there with my grandfather, and I noticed the barber, whose name was Adolf, who was at the first chair, and then the second chair was Mike, and it was summertime, so they had their short sleeve white little shirts on, barber shirts, and I noticed that they had numbers tattooed. I didn't know what tattooed, I just thought they were written. There was numbers, long numbers, on their arms, on their forearms. And I asked my grandfather, and my grandfather's name was Isidore, but I called him Izzy. And I said, Izzy, how come those men have those numbers on their arms? And my grandfather began to tell me the story of what had occurred during World War II and Nazi Germany and the Holocaust and the millions of Jews that were killed in the concentration camps. And unfortunately for me, I learned that at a young age and got to see pictures that were posted in the uh, Jewish newspaper. There was a newspaper called The Forward and it was all in Hebrew and they had pictures. My grandfather educated me by showing me the pictures and telling me the stories. And that was my, the first time in my life, you know, four years old, that I started learning that I was Jewish. My family unit was quite, I don't know, didn't seem any different than anybody else's, but I didn't live in anybody else's family unit but my own. And my family owned a chicken business, which was a live slaughterhouse in Newark, New Jersey. There was a lot of rage going on on my father's end. And, and then uh, the other influence was all the stories that I would hear as a child via my grandfather and my grandmother and uncles. The story stayed with me. And I would hear, hear all the stories of my grandfather's uh, escapades as a, a bootlegger with his father-in-law, my grandmother's dad, who was one of the bigger bootleggers in Newark, New Jersey. As a matter of fact, there was one story I heard that how he delivered liquor to Mayor Haig's home. And Mayor Haig was the mayor of Jersey City, New Jersey. And just a few years ago, there was a show on television. Um, it was Boardwalk Empire or something like that about Atlantic City and all the bootlegging and there was a character, uh, Nucky, Enoch Thompson, who was a key figure in the show and he had a relationship with uh, Mayor Haig. All of this uh, corruption was tied in and, and I sat there and going, I heard about all these stories when I was five and six years old. Music became a little bit more interesting. I think it was Buddy Holly and, and Elvis Presley. Buddy Holly was the reason I wanted to take guitar lessons. I had to discontinue the uh, music endeavors because it was time for me to go to Hebrew school and learn Hebrew and learn all it was needed for me to become a uh, bar mitzvah Jewish boy at the age of 13 years old. The event itself was, was rather spectacular. Must have had 200 people at this event and all my friends and extended family members and friends of the family. And my mother told me that my her father, my grandfather Reisman, uh, footed the bill for the, uh, the whole event. That was over. I was really relieved when I didn't have to go to Hebrew school anymore. I sort of had this this kind of feeling to 
assimilate into non-Jewish uh, surroundings, people-wise, because it was kind of tough being Jewish in 1960s America. I mean, even with the Jewish friends and family that I had, you know, it's like you go to somebody else's bar mitzvah when I got a little older and or a wedding and you're sitting there with your uh, cousin who's a doctor and the other cousin who's a lawyer and the other one who's an accountant and basically you're still in the family business of having a poultry market, uh, aka trying to be a creative uh, person creating different types of art. And in everybody's eyes, I, I was not a success. That is the direction I took. Uh, besides motorcycles, marijuana, uh, women, travel. And here it was, 1965, and I was getting ready to graduate high school. And I remember my uh, English teacher, especially John Harland. And by this time, we all knew what was happening in Vietnam. And his threat was, you know, hey, Brownstein, uh, you don't pass this class, you're going to Vietnam, boy, if you don't go to college. I wound up flunking out of school. Actually, that's a lie. I didn't flunk out. They threw me out. They threw me out of high school about three months before graduation because I was disruptive. I was getting into fights and whatnot, which was kind of difficult not to get into fights because I was being bullied by uh, kids that were anti-Semitic. They didn't really have a clue what that was, but they just hated Jews. So time goes by and I find myself, it's 1967, and, and I was living in Asbury Park, New Jersey, and this is what they call the summer of love. Everybody's got flowers in their hair and bell bottoms and sandals and funky sunglasses and, you know, smoking a little pot. That was also the year that I received a letter from the Selective Service Department, which meant I had to show up for my Army physical, and I was going to be uh, tested prior to being drafted and go to Vietnam. Well, the summer of love came to a screeching halt, and I hitchhiked 40, 45, 50 miles back up to, to uh, northern New Jersey, and I uh, went out with my friends the night before I had my army physical, and they said, well, what are you going to do? I says, I guess I'm going to Vietnam to kill or be killed. What am I going to do? I'm not running. I'm not, a, I'm not a punk. I'm not running to Canada. I just got to do what I got to do, I guess. So the next day, I went for my army physical. You know, they gave me a, a list, and they, they wanted to know what, what drugs I had done. And there was this list, you know, I, I had tried smoking pot, and, and uh, it, I think I did a diet pill once or twice, but I checked off every drug that was on there. I just checked it off, checked it off, checked it off, checked it off. And then they called me into the psychiatrist's office. And I uh, okay, you know, go sit over there. We got, and I went and sat over there, and the guy goes, you're a social deviant, aren't you? And I go, well, thank you. The end of the day comes, now they give you bus tickets to go home. As time went by, um, and this one was being drafted and that one was being drafted, I just sort of, you know, was in party mode figuring, hey, you know, uh, I could go at any minute, I might never return. So I went on with my life and then I found out about a year later that within a, a couple of months my mother received a letter from the Selective Service that I was classified as 4F and would not have to serve in the armed forces. I was happy of course but I didn't realize what the whole process had done to me as far as uh, life decisions. And unfortunately I, I developed a lifestyle that continued for the better part of my life, you know, drugs and drinking and partying and sex and, and just thinking that living each day was as if it was my last. Being that 
it was that era of the summer of love and the English invasion of music and hormones. Uh, it was just, for lack of a better word, or most people use it, partying. started observing, you know, you know, there was a specific type of artwork at the time, you know, with Peter Max and Andy Warhol. And I remember being in Asbury Park, it was like July, and a couple of buddies of mine and I were going to take a ride, take a bus ride up to Greenwich Village to see another friend of ours and see if we could get some pot or something. And here we are on the bus, and the bus route from Asbury Park to New York City actually went through Newark, New Jersey. And here we are on the bus, and we are in disbelief what was going on around us. I mean, it was just, there was state troopers, and there was the Army, I guess, National Guardsmen. There was 16 National, National Guardsmen on every corner of every inter intersection with, with guns, and buildings were burning. And, Later on, I found out that my grandfather uh, came to work that day to the chicken market. He got out there, and we had big glass windows in the front, and somebody with soap had written on the front of his windows, on both sides of the front door, on both windows, it said, Soul Brother, which meant to the people that were rioting, do not disturb this building, this business, because we like him. He is a good person, soul brother. He was part of the community. Our clientele was 99.9% .9 black at the time and had been for many, many years. This was the go-to place to get their live poultry. And they were treated always with, with love and respect. I'm thinking this is like 19... 68, and we were going to Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, to see Janis Joplin and Big Brother and the Holding Company. And we got to this place, it was called the Factory. He went downstairs and it was beams, it just looked like an old warehouse. Well, the, the opening act was John Hammond, a three-piece blues band. And, oh boy, they were great, and all of them were high on heroin. You could tell their eyes were pinned. Anyway, here comes Janis Joplin out, and it's a tiny little venue, and they just start playing and blowing us away. I remember uh, at the time, I was stringing beads. That was what I was doing for my little arts and crafts. I gave Janis Joplin a strand of beads, and she took them and she wrapped them around her wrist. A couple months later, I think I saw her in New York City. She was getting a little bit more popular and doing bigger venues. And I figured, well, this time I'm going to make a strand of beads, and I'm going to do two strands in one. So I went to the show, and I saw her at the show, and gave her the strand of beads, and sure enough, she takes them and wraps them around her wrist. Seven months later, she was doing another show in Jersey City. It was a wild night. Well, the show starts, and here's Janice up on stage, and she starts singing a song or two or three, and then at one point I decided, well, I'm going to jump up on the stage, and give her this strand of beads I made for her with three strands of beads in it. So I jump up on the stage, because I was sitting in the second row, and I'm up there, and Janice recognized me, of course, and I give her the beads, and she puts them on her wrist, and she takes my hand, and now I'm standing up on stage singing this song with Janice Joplin, and everybody is going wild. All the people that knew me in the crowds were just absolutely going wild. All of a sudden, from the side of the stage, some security guard comes over, and grabs me and throws me off the stage. But as I went down, I was looking up at Janice Joplin. And as I was going down, she saw the guy do this to me and she turned around and she sucker punched the guy right in the jaw. Never missed the beat, kept on singing. The crowd went fucking wild. And I wound up uh, hooking up with a couple of gals that night in the crowd and went home and had a party. You know. Eventually wound up uh, getting out of the chicken business and moving away to Florida and I started making jewelry down there doing the same thing and I spent a little time in Miami. Beginning of 1970 I was in uh, Coconut Grove, Florida right, right by Miami 
and we were meeting people from all over the United States, some of the people that produced uh, Woodstock previous summer. And there's this one character, his name was Whale, and he was a uh, you know, big beard and long hair. And he was friends with Fred Neal. Now, Fred Neal was a folk singer, kind of a guy from New York City who had relocated down in Coconut Grove. Well, this particular night, I was going to a Richie Havens concert. Richie Havens, back in the day, used to do covers of Fred Neal songs. Well, being friends with Fred Neal, they used to go sailing together, asked me if after the show I would speak to Richie Havens and bring him to Fred Neal's house. We get to the show and there's this young gal opening up for Richie Havens. Her name was Melanie. She was a Jersey girl. And having a great time, Richie Havens comes on and all of a sudden uh, the show is over and Richie Havens is going out the back gate of this stage and getting into a limousine. Anyway, I went up to the, uh, the window of the limo and I knocked on the window and the window rolls down and I go, Richie, uh, Fred Neal would like you to come to his house. He's never met you and he's having a little party in your honor if you show. And he says, sure, but I have to do an interview with the uh, college newspaper. So why don't you hop in the limo and we'll go from there. So I got in the limo with the girl I was with, and we went up to the hotel room, and they interviewed Richie. And after that, it was about 1 o'clock in the morning, we went to Fred Neal's house, and the two became best of friends. Fifteen years later, I was living in Asbury Park. It was like 1985, and there was a concert in Asbury at a venue, and Richie Havens was going to be there. So I go to the show, and I see Richie Havens up on stage, Funny thing was, you know, when, when I first met Richie Havens, he had no teeth. And now, since he became a little bit more affluent, he bought himself some teeth. And he had a great smile. But anyway, I go, Richie. And he looks down from the stage. He goes, Melanie concert, 1970. I mean, 15 years later, you re remembered me. And, and uh, it just goes to show you either uh, I'm pretty memorable or he had a good memory. I guess it was a uh, summer of 1970 a group of my friends and I decided we were going to uh, leave New Jersey and do a little caravan out to Colorado so one night about two o'clock in the morning there was a young man he was making himself a pair of moccasins I watched them for a while and I saw these uh, this graph paper and just for the heck of it I drew a little pattern on the graph paper was a, an eagle, a Native American style eagle, and there was beads there. So I decided to put my drawing into a physical form and uh, took some leather strips and cut holes and strung the beads, wound up with this little eagle. I had leather strips around it that I used to wear it around my neck and, you know, very fashionable. I had it under my collared shirt where just the eagle was showing and I remember walk, running into a Native American one time. He goes, oh, eagle power. And uh, I was very proud of this. I mean, this is, what, 2016? What does that make this? 46 years old. And it's, it's my first piece of wearable art. That's what I uh, put a label on, on my work that I do now as wearable art. Anyway, this is a piece I've been working on. Um, the uh, Day of the Dead Skull Bolo Tie. Now, a bolo tie is a men's or women's neck piece, jewelry neck piece. And this is uh, a wax model that I'll be casting this in bronze. And this is uh, Day of the Dead, which is what? Dias de la Muertas. Um, I just started, this is, I've always wanted to make, um, one of these sugar, they call them sugar skulls also. And I have many, many skulls, like plain skulls that I've done and, um, you know, a variety of, of other different skulls for, for biker wear and, and, you know, motorcycle Harley Davidson, uh, rings. And so I finally got this one out of the box and I have a ring and I have a bracelet and I figured I was going to do a pendant. All 
although I've done you know many different types of commission pieces for people your traditional stuff but this has always been my style the braiding I found out about lost wax casting and that's what this is I create these sculptures in wax and then do a plaster casting of it and do the finishing I found out about that back in 1968 while I was living in Hollywood California I went to this little store on Sunset Boulevard that these two guys had they were a couple of couple of strange ones I mean, there was quite a few strange people out there it seemed like everybody at the time was searching for something I remember remember meeting people that were uh, Hare Krishna's and there was there was there was other people that were uh, Trotskyists and then there was these other uh, group of people they used to chant Nam Yo Renge Kyo and then there was the the uh, yogis around and everybody was going doing yoga and but anyway I met these two guys and went into their store and I, I saw this little box it had this little green ring in it and I go hey uh, what's that he goes oh I carved that in wax and I'm going to cast it in silver I go yeah how do you do that and he explained the process of lost wax casting to me as time went on uh, I decided I was gonna leave California go back to New Jersey <laughs> Fast forward another year or so, I had a friend of mine who was a diamond setter, and he gave me a little, came to me at Christmas time one time with a, a little gold Coke spoon with my initials on it. And I go, how'd you do that? He says, oh, I carved it in wax and cast it. It's for you for Christmas, but give me $20 for the gold. A number of years went by, and I met my future wife. I figured I was getting close to the age of having a family. I decided I was going to ask her to marry me. I came up with the idea of creating a ring in wax, and I designed a little ring that was the actually an Egyptian ankh. And I gave it to her, and, and she loved it. And I wanted to make a ring that this engagement ring would fit into. And I went to another designer, and they wanted to charge me X amount of dollars to do the project. I sort of did a little ciphering in my head. So I already knew that they were just going to take wax and carve it. And I knew how much metal cost at the time, and I could estimate how much it was. I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to try this myself. So I went to New York City to a jewelry supply place. And I bought wax, and I bought little waxing tools and little melting tools. And I went home, and I carved this wax, and there was my first piece of jewelry. That was the beginning, and I never looked back. The passion was just, as soon as I had that piece cast and finished it myself, polished it, I was just on fire. I would stay up until, you know, I had a full-time job, but I would stay up until 2, 3 in the morning um, working on wax. <laughs> I was chicken man by day and jewelry by night. And I spent a number of years uh, in my little workshop till two o'clock every morning creating stuff and, and learning as I went along and, and uh, experimenting. I, um, I weave wax, I braid wax, I twist wax, uh, and I sculpt wax. And I got excited. All of a sudden I had a line of uh, 18 different bracelets. And how that happened was um, I had this wax wire and I heard a voice that said, why don't you try braiding? Why don't you try braiding? Why don't you try braiding? This is six wires and I can do two different types of braiding on it. I can do a flat braid or I can actually fold over the braid like this. And I go, okay, and followed the lead and started braiding wax. Before you know it, I had all these different patterns and I was ready to go. I w took my 18 different bracelets and went to New York City and I was in the Independent Craftsman's Division down in the basement of the McAlpin Hotel, 
and I sat there with my um, contract. I sat there for three days, and no, nothing happened. I, and finally, the last hour of the last day, I hear a voice of a woman, and she says, uh, excuse me, aren't you going to start writing? And I said, writing? She goes, yes, I would like to order from you. And I go, oh. And she says, I want three of those, and I want two of these, and I want two of those. And next thing you know, I had written down $3,000 worth of merchandise. So I went home and started making the bracelets. And fortunately for Fortune Offs, it was Fortune Offs apartment store. She was a silver buyer. I delivered it to West, Westbury, Long Island, the day they were due. <music> Halloween, 1978, and I had purchased four tickets to see Frank Zappa at the, uh, the Academy of Music in New York City. He always did a Halloween show in New York City. So after the show, and it was, happened to be the first show, uh, the two girls that I went with worked for uh, Warner Brothers Records at the time. So at the end of the evening, two or three hours, four hours later, we wind up uptown at a place called Elaine's, which was rather popular back in the day. Sat down in, uh, towards the back of the, of the restaurant, and all of a sudden I hear a voice that sounded familiar and I sort of turned around and it happened to be Frank Zappa. He was with a couple of gals and the two girls that Frank Zappa was with knew the two girls that I was with. So everybody uh, introduced each other and we said, hey, you want to sit here? And, and the girls put the tables together. So here I am having dinner with Frank Zappa. And just, just kidding around, I pulled out this fourth ticket that was not used for his concert and one of the girls he was with says, oh, would you like him to sign it? And I kind of like, you know, looked at Frank. Frank looked at me. We were, he knew I wasn't into that. And, and I go, well, you know, we just sort of shook it off, looked at the girls like, you know, come on, girls, get real. And I just put the ticket down on the table, and we continued our conversation. As a matter of fact, I was telling him that for about three months, I lived in the house that he lived in, in Laurel Canyon, a few years before I lived in it. Anyway, he looked at me and he looked at the ticket and just nonchalantly picked the ticket up and he happened to be um, eating pea soup. And he took the ticket and he goes like this and he dips the ticket in the corner of the ticket in his soup. And he took it out and shook off a little drop of soup and here's this like, corner of the ticket covered in pea soup and he goes how's this for an autograph I went to Hawaii in 1985 on a vacation it was a little extended vacation about three months I was with this gal who thought she was a singer-songwriter we went to a Willie Nelson concert and she was all excited so she wrote a song about Willie Nelson and she wanted to give it to him. So we went to the show and she ran up to the front of the stage and she handed him the, the, uh, the piece of the paper with the, with the song she had written on it. He looked at her and took the paper from her, put it down on his amp and you know, she was gonna get off the stage and he sort of grabbed her and said, wow, you know, like, where are you going? And you know, he gave her a big hug and she gave him a big hug and she got off the stage and she was all excited. You know. She put our phone number on the piece of paper and, so the next day we go to the beach and about five o'clock in the afternoon and it's time to go over to Charlie's bar and, and get some pizza and beers. And we walk into the into the bar and the place is packed. And who's sitting there but Willie Nelson? And there's a, ba a little local band playing. Willie's sitting at this little half round table up against the wall. I mean, it's a tiny little bar. So I walked right over to him and I go, hey, Willie, remember that gal from last night that gave you the, the song she wrote? And he looked dead in my eyes and his eyes lit up and he goes, yeah. And I go, well, here she is. Willie, this is Gina. He, Willie goes, oh, why don't you sit down with me? I was rather excited myself. I mean, here I met Willie Nelson. I'm hanging out with him. Now he's inviting me over to his house, even though I know he's only invited me over to the house because of this hot babe I'm with. 
So she puts a towel around her, puts her flip-flops on, and we drive over to Willie's house. And Willie says to me, you know, he says, hey, do you, do you play chess? And I go, well, yeah, I play, I can play chess. He whips out this little chess board, opens that up. Meanwhile, he, we're in the middle of smoking a big fat Maui Wowie joint. He had a bud probably that long. Now, each time he said checkmate, he would go, <laughs> Checkmate. And I go, Willie, how did you learn how to play chess so well? And he goes, well, on the tour bus, I have a computerized chess set. And I would play that in my spare time. I had a lot of spare time driving show to show. So now, hours and hours pass. There's one joint left. And I say, Willie, we have to leave. It's time. We have to go do our laundry. We're leaving town tomorrow. He gives me the fat joint. He gives me his phone number to his studio in, in Perdinalis. Texas, and we go on our merry way. I moved to Hawaii probably 1990, and I did the same thing there. Um, did what I could do to make a living and made jewelry on the side. Spent a few years in Hawaii, and I wound up moving to Minnesota. I developed a great jewelry business in Minnesota. I lived in Minneapolis. It took me 16 years to do it. And then all of a sudden, I was relocated to Phoenix, Arizona. My wife decided that she wanted to live in Arizona near her sister. Before I even got down to Arizona, I made some phone calls, and I found myself some studio space in Scottsdale, Arizona, and started doing craft shows and um, farmer's markets, joined a couple of art guilds. From there, I decided to uh, set my tables out at a motorcycle bar up in Cave Creek and I did that for weekends for a couple of seasons and it did quite well but kind of got burnt out from uh, doing all of that. Now that I'm uh, 68 years old that pop-up tent that we all are all these uh, artists use gets heavier and heavier every year so I decided to try a different approach now I'm just using Facebook I've got a couple of thousand friends on Facebook and I have developed in the last 10 years here a clientele some of which are collectors and and uh, they buy a couple of pieces a year I was just visiting with another jewelry friend of mine and he said you know it's important that you pass what you know on and I go well yeah I, I've taught a couple of people I can teach my process and show people how it's done because I've developed this process and, and my creativity over the years where there's no trial and error on their part. It's, I, I got all the tricks that I can teach them. The only problem is you can't teach somebody passion. Basically I sculpt in wax and create my pieces in, in silver and gold and bronze and copper. And I've been doing that since 1972. Do the math, I don't know how many years that is actually. 46 years, 44 years, something. Yeah, 44 years, wow. was the beginning of the whole, the whole getting paid, <laughs> the beginning of getting paid for my passion.